What I'm giving tonight is startling. I hope that you are partially knowledgeable. I hope that you at least know somewhat of the fact that there is a plot for the destruction of your freedom. Otherwise, what is being said tonight could be very, very dangerous to your mental thought patterns, if I may say. A number of months ago, I met a gentleman by the name of John Bergen. John Bergen is an outstanding businessman of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Quite well to do and owns one of the largest nut importers of America, importing firms of America. John Bergen is very well respected in Minneapolis and is a very reputable individual, not a novice by any stretch of the imagination. He has political clout. And when he goes to Washington, even though Minneapolis and Minnesota are very liberal, even the liberals listen to him. John Bergen said to me some while back, Lindsay, you need to know a gentleman by the name of Jonathan May. I said, who is Jonathan May? I had never heard his name. He said, Jonathan May is a citizen of England. And he said, Jonathan May has traveled extensively worldwide, knows the issues, became quite knowledgeable through certain sources in the Council of Foreign Relations and Trilateral Commission as to what the internationalists intend to do worldwide. It so disturbed him, and having certain Arab sources that he knew, he decided that he would attempt to counteract the game plan of the internationalists. Now, the internationalists are the ones that I attempt to describe in my latest book, Syndrome of Control, a group of power elite individuals, probably no more than 12 to 15 people, who hold the purse strings of every nation in the world and control most of the governments of the world through the control of their finances. He found out what these individuals were doing, and it so startled him until he decided that he would counteract what they were doing by establishing a worldwide Federal Reserve. You do recognize, of course, that the Federal Reserve System controls the money, the interest rate, the general economy, your lifestyle and mine, of every person in America. It is not an agency of the federal government. And so Jonathan May decided he would establish a worldwide Federal Reserve in order to help save certain nations. He got the Arabs to invest multi amounts of money. I cannot name the exact figure. You'll hear him give some of it tonight himself in his own words. The Arabs had already said, we will be involved. At the point that the Arabs were to deliver the funds in order to start this new creature, the internationalists in England found out about it. They threatened the life of Jonathan May and would not allow the Arabs to transfer the money into England for him to start this. At that point, Jonathan May felt that his life was in jeopardy and he came to America. He did the wrong thing, of course, because the exact same powers that be that control England likewise control America. And in August of 1986, Jonathan May was arrested and put in federal prison in Minneapolis, Minnesota on erroneous charges. John Bergen put me in touch with him by telephone because I was not allowed to go to the federal prison. Jonathan May, after numerous conversations, and after a lot of persuasion, agreed to allow me to tape a conversation over the telephone, which you'll hear parts of tonight. In this conversation, he tells the game plan, the timetable, and the inner manipulations of the power elite of the world as he knew it because of certain sources that he had. He gives his story as to what happened to him. Now, the 20 to 25 minute tape that we're going to be listening to in sections tonight and an explanation with almost every statement, you're going to find it very unique, indifferent, uh, different, startling, and possibly very, very disturbing in some senses, yet information-wise will probably be some of the most in-depth information that you or I have ever heard. The reason I say that is because I have been studying this issue for the past six years. I have traveled extensively nationwide. Last year, I was seven months on the road without ever stopping and averaged two speaking engagements per day, averaged crisscrossing America every other week, and I thought that I knew most of the answers to what the boys were doing. After hearing Jonathan May, 
and having him tell me some things that only top executives in the oil companies had told, which I had never told in public, I was willing to believe that his story was credible because for the first time, Jonathan May put together some pieces of the puzzle that allowed me to see the complete total picture that I had never been able to put together since 1973 and four when I first sat in the board meetings with the oil company officials and found out that there positively was a plot for the control of America and the world, its finances and its people by a group of power elite and heard the top echelon oil companies officials saying it and telling about it in their own words. That was when I first became knowledgeable and disturbed and since then I've tried to put all the pieces together but there were some pieces that I never could get because I did not have inroads into the CFR and the Trilateral Commission and the inner workings and manipulations of such, such organizations as the Bilderbergers and others. Jonathan May did have inroads into those organizations because of his worldwide travel and many contacts that he had and put together the final pieces of the puzzle. Now what I'm going to do that's so unique and different tonight, I have in my hand a tape recorder which I'm hoping will be audible easily over the public address system and I'm going to play portions of Jonathan May's explanation to you. Then I will stop and draw on the chalkboard the related subjects that will cause us to be able to understand the complete picture. And as far as I know, this is the first audience ever that this information has been given to. I have never given it before in public. I do not know what the repercussions of what I'm doing tonight will be. I do know that certain things are told on this cassette tape that the powers that be would be very startled if they knew they were known because very few knew them except the top echelon themselves. Therefore, we will give a portion of the tape an explanation with the related material. So I'll begin at this time by playing just a portion and then I'll go back for an explanation. Here goes Jonathan May in his own words, in his own voice, right from the federal jail in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we go and then an explanation after a portion of his talk. First of all, there are 13 families that effectively control the central banks of the hard currency countries. The hard currency countries are the countries whose currencies are caused not to fluctuate uh, as much as the other countries' currencies fluctuate. Those 13 families have the control of the policy making and decision making of the central banks of those countries. Those families are referenced in my book, To Seduce a Nation, and the eight of them are listed, which are the owners of the majority of the stock of the regional banks of the Federal Reserve System. It's rather strange that 13 families, 13 as you know is an unlucky number both in scripture and uh, the world usually uses the word 13 as a uh, re number related to uh, unusual and wicked things. 13 families that control the currency of the world. Now those are the families that basically manipulate gold prices every morning on the London Exchange. They're the 13 families who control the regional banks of the Federal Reserve. The 13 families that would control the currencies that are not allowed to fluctuate. You may note that the American dollar is the standard for all of the currency of the world. Wherever the American dollar goes, other nations are affected in relation to that dollar. Not only do these 13 families control the, bank, the currency, but likewise control the banks in the leading nations of the world, the industrialized nation. With this, he goes on to say, They all with one accord practice fractional reserve banking. Um, Fractional Reserve Banking allows, has allowed the central banks to permit the prime banks whose owners and controllers are the same people as the central banks to lend up to 26 units of currency for every one unit of currency they have, quote, on deposit. He says that all of the banks that are controlled by these 13 families 
practice fractional reserve banking. And they're allowed to loan up to 26 to 1 illustration. Now, this is perfectly legal in America. Fractional reserve banking is practiced by every lending institution in America and is a legal method of banking in this country. In order to explain fractional reserve banking, I need to do the following. Uh, Conrad, do you mind if I pick on you for a moment? You look like a typical banker. He's sitting there, he's kind of bald on top, and he has a nice uh, fancy leather coat on. His shoes are well polished, and his wife looks real neat sitting beside him with hair combed back and in a suit. And he looks like the typical uh, local banker who would never do you wrong. And let's see, uh, this gentleman sitting right down here, you look like the average individual who would like to deposit $1,000 into your friendly, smiling banker's bank who would never do anything wrong for you. And so you have a thousand, now you wouldn't dare do this, but let's just pretend for a moment that you would. You have a thousand dollars and you take it down to this gentleman's bank, he's the bank president, and you deposit a thousand dollars in his bank in a savings account, and it's a savings and loan. That savings and loan is allowed or is required by law to keep five percent in reserve and can loan out 95 percent of your thousand dollars, which means they can loan out nine hundred and fifty dollars. They loaned out that $950 to this, uh, uh, this gentleman sitting right over here who would like to build a room onto his house. So he takes the $950 down to the lumber supply place and buys that much lumber. Well, the lumber supply place does business with Bank B. This is Bank A over here. And Bank B is likewise required to keep 5%, which is $47.50, and can loan out $902.50 to this gentleman sitting right down here who filters it back into the economy through the grocery store into Bank C because the grocery store does business for Bank C. Bank C is required to keep 5%, which is $45.13, and can loan out $857.37. Now that money is filtered back into the economy because it was loaned to this gentleman over here and filters back into Bank D. Bank D is required to keep $42.87 and can loan out $814.50 and you continue that scenario all the way down to zero, and sir, here's what we come up with. Your $1,000 deposit in your friendly, smiling banker's bank who would never do you wrong. Those bankers are allowed using fractional reserve banking to loan out $20,229.60. And it's being practiced by every lending institution in America Oh, by the way, that doesn't even include the interest on the indebtedness. That's only the principal. Where does the interest come from? It's better known as the national debt. They turn up the presses faster and faster and faster every day in order to be able to pump more into the economy just to bolster up the fractional reserve banking alone. And Jonathan May says, they're allowed to loan out $22 for every $1 that you put in their fractional reserve banking bank's bank. Now, 13 families control the hard currency of the world, fractional, practice fractional reserve banking, and as Paul Harvey says, here's the rest of the story. The initial final stages of the final phase of System 2000, which is the global creditors unilateral totalitarian plan, were put into effect back in the mid-70s. A Pentagon official and three other US government officials visited the Prime Minister of Nigeria, paid him $50 million to double, in fact, more than double the price of Bonnie Light, which is a crude oil from Nigeria. Now he says that they visited Nigeria and said that they would give them $50 million across the board in cash with no repayment if they would be willing to double the price of light oil. Basic explanation is following. Only two nations in the world have light crude. Light crude oil is an oil that as it comes out of the ground, it could almost be used in your automobile. It's the most valuable oil in the world. And according to the price of light crude, all other oil in the world is priced in accordance with the way those two nations price 
light crude. Whoever controls the price of light crude oil likewise controls all the oil prices in the world. Therefore, he said, they went to Nigeria, one of the two nations that has light crude, said, we'll give you this money if you will double the price of light crude. Now, the Arabs come into picture. At the same time, Bush and some other of the Trinational Commission were in the Middle East, persuading the Middle East nations and England to consolidate OPEC, of which, of course, America is also a part, but never mentioned. The deal cut with the Middle Eastern oil producers was that the oil buyers were prepared to pay significantly higher prices for the oil, provided the Middle Eastern nations supported America, this is how it was put, by investing the revenues in the big banks in America. Arabs, who today are sheikhs and sheikhs, 30 to 40 years ago were nomads roaming the deserts riding camels. The international bankers found out that there was oil in their countries. They went and persuaded them to allow them to produce that oil by financing their oil fields. After they had financed their oil fields, they charged them usury for building their oil supply systems and their refineries. After the usury had been repaid because the Arabs became rich so quickly, back in those days, you were paying at the gas pump 30 cents per gallon for gasoline. First of all, the international bankers went to Nigeria, double the price of light crude. Then, unbeknownst to the Arabs, who had become wealthy overnight, knew nothing about international finance, had just been riding their camels out in the desert a few years ago, now they go to them and say, we will take the price of crude oil to any place you want it to go, as high as you would like it to go, if you will take a portion of the funds that you get from this new price rise that we're going to give you and deposit it in the international bankers' banks in New York. And you must deposit it in 30-year time certificates. Are you beginning to see now why 71, 72, 73, and 74, that prices of oil skyrocketed. It was because the international bankers who have the purse strings of the world knew that the increase in the price of oil that was going to the Arabs would come right back to their banks as 30-year time certificate deposits. Now, watch what they intended to do with those 30-year time certificate deposits, and you begin to get a picture of what's happening. Sheikh Imani's nephew assured us that Sheikh Imani and the other oil ministers did not know until late in the 70s, early in the 80s, that the controlling interests of the prime banks were also the same people who had the controlling interests of the major oil companies. The sheikhs of that day and time did not understand world finance. They did not know that the international bankers were taking them, and neither did they understand that America's major oil companies, such as Standard Oil, Atlantic Richfield, and the other major oil companies, were likewise controlled by the money of the international bankers' banks in New York. Therefore, the total picture of intake of profit on the part of the international bankers was all coming back to them. These Arabs, not understanding any of this international finance, fell for the plot of the international bankers, and little by little, the story becomes more bizarre. Actually, through a joint stock trust that was set up by the original Rockefeller here in, in America in 1870, three years before the U.S. government declared joint stock trusts illegal in 1873, it is that entity that is the ultimate controlling factor in America of the prime banks of the Federal Reserve Board. There was a joint stock trust. They're no longer legal in America, but they were set up in the 1800s, and it's under those joint stock trusts that the international bankers' banks in New York are allowed to operate, which other banks in America are not allowed to operate under. Do you wonder why the Chase Manhattan Chemical Bank uh, J.P. Morgan's bank and the others in New York are showing all-time record earnings 
while around America, literally hundreds of banks per month are going broke. The reason is, is because they are operating under a grandfather clause of a joint bank trust, which is no longer legal, but because of the grandfather clause, they can operate in New York, that section of banks, and in so doing, take these finances and be able to manipulate with them, both us and the Arabs. And with this, he continues. The major oil companies and many of the major multinationals, that trust is, is in joint control of the Rockefeller Foundation and the uh, European interests. Bank Trust controls both the Rockefeller Foundation, controls the, um, the Federal Reserve, and it's the method whereby they were able to gain control of the currency of the United States of America back in 1913 through the Federal Reserve, which no one else can do because those trusts are no longer allowed. The deal cut with the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and the Middle Eastern people was that they should put their money in the prime banks. They did not know that the prime banks were able to lend 20 to 1, I think it is in this country, but maybe more now, but their revenues, all they were receiving was the interest on the money they deposited. Now the Arabs did not realize that fractional reserve banking could be practiced by these banks. They did not understand banking. Remember, they had just been nomads on the deserts not too long ago. But through this, the international bankers were able to gain the control of the money of the Arab world and the Arab world only received back the interest, the interest off of the money that they had put into the international bankers' banks under these 30-year time deposits. Between 10 and 30 years, receiving the principal at the end of the term, because they had locked in deposits, the banks were then able to make loans to the third world nations. Now, through the funds that they had gained from the Arabs, which was directly related to the increase of oil prices, through a manipulation that had been made with the Arab world, and taking the price of your gasoline from 30 cents a gallon to a dollar and 20 cents a gallon, now with this money coming back into the international bankers' banks, they take those funds, which originally came from you and from me, and invested them in the third world countries. You do remember, 15, 20 years ago, when the international bankers started investing in third world country loans. The countries that are going broke today, they invested back then, but they wanted those countries to go broke, and here is that part of the story. Knowing and relying on the greed of the ministers of these nations to mishandle that money over the years to the extent where that manipulated greed has caused those countries to be in the position they're in. They wanted those third world countries to go broke. You'll remember about the time that most of the third world countries were getting their independence, independence from England, independence from France, independence from uh, America, and they were setting up their own governments. Now he said at that point, the international bankers loaned them these large sums of money, which had come to them through the Arabs as a result of their oil prices. At this point, he, the international bankers wanted the third world countries to misuse those funds. They intended for them to go broke. It was part of the plan for those third world countries to squander the funds. Remember that the new leaders of these countries themselves had never governed any country before. They knew very little even about government. They had only been colonial countries under some other country. So the international bankers knew that their leaders would squander the money that was being given to them, which international bankers had taken from the Arabs and of rich, uh, just from you originally through oil prices. And now here is where it goes. In 1981, I was exposed to uh, trying to help the Hunt Brothers in Texas because they, with John Connolly, who was, the, who was then the governor of Texas, who was also then the Undersecretary of the Treasury, had secretly tried to um, implement a currency, a new currency for Texas, since Texas is only a part of the Union by treaty, which is automatically renewed every year, but not necessarily automatically renewed every year. It's become a tradition, obviously, that it's renewed every year, but it's actually not renewed every year. Every year. Did you know that Texas is not a state 
by vote, such as other states, but a, vote, a state by treaty. I see one head shaking here on the front. Texas is a state by treaty, not by vote. Now you must know that Texas at one time became very wealthy and independent individuals such as the Hunt brothers who years ago were nothing but they were made rich overnight through the wealth of oil in Texas when oil was first struck and became so popular in the early days. Texas being the place where the Hunt brothers lived and John Conley being the governor of Texas at one time and you remember was in the uh, limousine with John F. Kennedy when he was shot and they tried to shoot Conley also but he went down the floorboard of the vehicle and lived through it to tell it. Well there's a story behind why John Conley was attempted to be assassinated and while the Hunt brothers today are bankrupt men that were multi-billionaires 15 years ago were some of the wealthiest men in the world, the Hunt brothers and today I was just in Dallas, Texas a few weeks ago, my wife and I and an individual who was a friend of ours met with the Hunt brothers. They are in court right now in the process of attempting to uh, stall off financial bankruptcy. They have been bankrupted by the internationalists. And the reason that the Hunt brothers are being broken today is because the internationalists knew what the Hunt brothers and Connolly, former governor of Texas, were trying to do. Texas being a state by treaty, not by vote, any time that Texas wishes to, they cannot renew their treaty for that year and could legally secede from the Union. And the Hunt brothers and John Connolly knew that Texas had the ability of setting up their own country, become, having their own currency, and being solvent and not under the, the dictates of the Federal Reserve or the bureaucracy in Washington, and they were in the process of gaining a corner on the silver of the world in order to be able to finance a process whereby they could overcome the international bankers. And at that point, the Hunt brothers were broken, John Connolly was almost killed, and Texas, who could have been the only state in the Union to fulfill it, had some major problems. And today, Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, you ride through the cities and you would vow and declare that it was almost a ghost town in certain areas. Storefronts are closed. People have moved out of $150,000, $200,000 homes. The internationalists became so angry at what Texas had done until they broke the back of the oil industry and the major oil producers of Texas. And it was all by a design plan. And we go further. And the intention was that Texas was going to create its own money. The Hunts were in partnership with the Shah of Iran, a German banker and an Austrian banker. The Federal Reserve Board got to hear about it. The Hunts were buying silver irresponsibly because they had one man doing both buying and selling on the same floors of all the exchanges and word got out. And the result of that was that the German banker was murdered. Uh, you may remember the Bader Meinhof terrorists at the time who only actually ever murdered one person. Although the a lot of industrialists were captured and uh, held to ransom and various other things. Only one actually man, which was a banker, ever got murdered. And it was that banker that was the partner of the Hunts. Hunt Brothers of Texas and a banker were attempting to do this. He said that one was killed, the Shaw of Iran was deposed, and the Hunt Brothers today are filing for bankruptcy. You see what the internationalists can do whenever you attempt to thwart their plan. The Austrian banker was so badly beaten up that you'll never get out of a, of a mental institution. And the Hunts, you know what happened to them, they're virtually bankrupt today despite the fact that they had about 16 billion in worth at the time. Uh, the Shah was perfectly healthy when he left Iran. He was, he was only declared sick when he arrived in America, held in, quote, protective custody, unquote in U.S. military bases where he was treated. The Shah of Iran was in perfect health when he left Iran. When he came here, they saw to it that he died. You know it can very easily be done by chemical and germ warfare. The rest of the story of the deposing of the Shah of Iran is dared to be printed in my latest book, Syndrome of Control. Congressman George Hansen tells the story. You'll remember that Con Congressman Hansen was in the House of Representatives in Washington. 
He heard what was happening in Iran and wanted to investigate. Congress would not let him go. This story, by the way, is told minute by minute, hour by hour, in this book for the first time in copyrighted form. You'll want to get it and read it for yourself. He went to Iran, paid his own airline ticket to go over. When he got there, the Khomeini gave him an audience. The Khomeini said, we don't want these hostages any more than you want us to have them. That wasn't what we were told by the media, was it? Khomeini said, I would like to give you one half of the hostages to take home with you tomorrow morning if you will promise to start an investigation into the relationship between the Shah of Iran, Chase Manhattan Bank, Henry Kissinger, and President Carter. Congressman Hansen called back to someone in Congress whose name he mentions in this book and says, I can bring half of the hostages home tomorrow. Would you like me to? He said, I'll call you back tomorrow and tell you. Would you believe America held hostage while he says we'll call you back tomorrow and tell you whether you can bring them home or not? The next day the call came back. Congressman Hansen was told, get on the next airplane, come home. Don't bring any hostages with you. Do not do any negotiating. You have no right to speak on the part of the Congress of the United States of America, even though you are a congressman. Get home immediately. When he came back, he found out that it was documented, by the way, and placed in the congressional record, he found that President Carter knew that the hostages were going to be taken. He knew approximately how long they were going to be kept. He knew that they were there for a reason. And the release of the hostages was not negotiated by the State Department of the United States of America. The release of the hostages in Iran was negotiated by a negotiator of Chase Manhattan Bank in New York. And the hostages were kept and America held hostage while the bankers got the Shaw's money in their banks before he was killed and in turn got much of the money of Iran. And do you wonder that Iran is mad at us today? After the shenanigans we pulled to get their money into Chase Manhattan Bank so it could remain solvent and be one of the wealthiest institutions in the world today, that is what Jonathan May is speaking of, and we continue. And became progressively worse and ultimately was shipped off to die. Uh, not before all his assets had been frozen, uh, which doesn't make much sense um, until he realized the the ploy of the, of the globalists. Um, that's something of a red herring, but it's interesting. The, in 1983, we became aware of the fact that a group of very, very quiet bank holding companies, which are authorized under Regulation Y, Section 225.4, uh, of USC. To All right, he says that they formed a group of bank holding companies. The international bankers' banks did. And the reason they formed them was so that they could not be held responsible, so that Chase Manhattan Chemical Bank and J.P. Morgan's bank could not be held responsible for the money that the Arabs had been put into their banks. They formed bank holding companies who in turn would loan out the money to the third world countries. Knowing that the third world countries were going to go broke after they had already destroyed the Shaw, had the money in their banks, loaning out exorbitant amount of money, determining they were going broke, and letting the bank holding companies hold these loans. Knowing what was going to happen when these third world countries went broke. To extend credit, also to do it internationally incidentally, but to extend credit wherever they feel like it, under whatever terms they feel like it, under regulation Y. We became aware of the fact that those companies were receiving loans from the prime banks to buy foreclosed real property in the form of agricultural property and businesses with bricks and mortar. One was for the purpose of loaning money to the third world countries. The second bank holding company was for the purpose of borrowing money from the international bankers' banks in order to purchase farm land. Isn't this rather interesting? To purchase farmland and farms and certain corporations in the United States of America. So here we have two bank holding companies. One, loaning money to third world countries from the Arabs' money coming through the international bankers' banks. One, purchasing farmland and certain businesses in America that are making a lot of money. The farmland and the businesses will continue to make money. The third world countries are designated to 
Go under. From liquidations and foreclosures and bankruptcies which were being effected uh, by the FDIC and the FSLIC, which are indeed subsidiaries, at least totally under the control of the Federal Reserve Board. We couldn't understand this. And literally dozens of banks weekly all over America are being bought. Who has the money to buy these banks, by the way? And where did they get the money to buy these banks from? It's being bought by the high oil price money that goes to the Arabs, deposited into the international bankers' banks. They buy the banks that are intentionally being closed around America, some of which are still solvent. They're also buying the farmland of America through the farmers that are being put into bankruptcy because of the high American dollar in relation to foreign currencies, which I'll deal with that subject tomorrow afternoon. And they're doing it all with our own money, which pays for gasoline at the pump, which goes to the Arabs, to the international bankers' banks, to the bank holding companies, which purchases the banks back in America that are going under today. If you wonder where they're getting all the money from to do these things, now you know. It's your own money through gas prices. And between 1983 and 1985, um, we searched it and still couldn't understand it. In the end of 1985, we were approached by an emissary from President... Hang on, just... An emissary of President Marcos and President Sahate and another uh, from Indonesia with with a severe problem that they had. And that problem they had was that having borrowed all the money they borrowed, they needed more money. Um, but the only way that the IMF were prepared to lend them money was if they eliminated their own currency, became dollar denominated, subsequently eliminated cash altogether, and went on to a, a unilateral centralized a credit card system, which was part of their social security system, part of their identity system. I must stop. I gave this such a long period of time because you need to get the entire statement. Marcos, an emissary from Marcos in the Philippines. You do know that Marcos was deposed one year ago. And Indonesia came to Jonathan May and said, the international bankers, banks in New York a representative from those banks have just come to us and said, we will forgive all of your loans. You cannot pay them back. You can't pay back the interest. You can't pay back the principal. Well, we'd like to make you a bargain. We will forgive your loans. By the way, whose money was that that they had loaned out to these third world countries? It wasn't theirs. Whose was it? It was the Arab money because of high oil prices that the people of the world had paid. And they said, we will forgive your loans, your principal and your interest. You never have to pay it back if you will do the following. Number one, do away with your national currency. Does this sound familiar? Do away with your national currency. Dollar denominate, dollar denominate your new currency. Go to a debit card system instead of a currency system. And if you will give us perpetual rights to all natural resources in your country. Just after that, by the way, Marcos in the Philippines was deposed. Why? He told the international bankers to get out of his country. He would not give them sovereignty over his country. And here's what happened. Everybody in the country, um, social security number was synonymous with a credit number, and then their central bank was to act as the wholesaler for credit, which was extended to it by the new super bank, which was announced by Paul Volcker on the 27th of October 1985, and subsequently almost immediately ratified by Ronald Reagan, the six digits of the name of which all are, I mean the three the digits of the three names of which all add up to six, incidentally. Um, a further contingent condition 
of the benevolence of the IMF, and I'm being facetious, was that in order to help the economy of that country, those countries, the IMF were going to nominate uh, external, non-domestic corporations to properly engineer and exploit and, and excavate the minerals of those countries, the natural resources of those countries, in return for perpetual royalties and in return for those same companies' nomination of the, all the ancillary companies that would be involved with the exploration and excavation thereby bringing prosperity to the nation, but Marcos was sharp enough to pick up the word perpetual and realized quite obviously that in so doing he would be signing away the sovereignty of his nation. So Marcos realized what the international bankers were doing to him, that if he gave them perpetual rights to all of the minerals of his country, even though the international bankers had promised that they would send in corporations to develop these minerals, but that they themselves would get the profits from those minerals, but yet it would put the people in the Philippines to work. Yet Marcos knew that if he gave them this contract of perpetual rights, that he was giving up the sovereignty of his country to the International Bankers Banks and to the International Monetary Fund, Marcos at this point told them, I will not do it, get out of my country, and it was only a matter of weeks after that that Marcos was deposed by whom? None other than riots incited by payment of the international bankers, banks themselves, as Jonathan May continues to show. And was not prepared to do that. Uh, and approached us to his emissary, one of the colonels, uh, Colonel Christopher Banis, who came to see us. Uh, we were aware before we were approached of this offer made by the IMF through our connections in London, who are close to Sir Geoffrey Howe. And we were also aware of the Arab connections that had happened earlier. In return for President Sahate and President Marcos's uh, capitulation to the IMF terms and conditions, uh, they were to have their existing debts forgiven, absolutely, and the new lines of credit that were to be extended to them were to be uh, upon better terms and conditions. When we heard the word perpetual, when we heard the word totally forgiven, we then immediately began to recognize what the another group of holding companies operating with the previous group of holding companies that we mentioned were doing and what they were doing the second group of holding companies was receiving credit from the first group of holding companies to purchase assets and liabilities from the prime banks now the only liabilities they were purchasing were the liabilities represented by the deposits of the Arab nations. The only assets they were buying were the assets represented by the loans made to some of the debtor nations. Now you'll notice that these two holding companies to which the money was given by the International Bankers Bank so that they could not be held responsible for what happened to the money that went out, the holding companies were holding nothing but liabilities of the loans made to the third world countries which they could not repay. Now it is designed, as he's going to show, that the third world countries default on their payment. By the way, did you hear something about that this past week? It was on the news. What countries said that they would not pay? Brazil and what else? Argentina. Both of them said, we're not going to pay. They didn't tell you that agreements had been made with those countries to eventually forgive their loans, did they? If they would sign away perpetually the rights to the minerals of those countries. Watch out, you're going to see a rash of third world countries not paying their debts, and then here is what will happen on the heels of that. The bank holding companies are designed to go broke. 
and watch the events from that point on. It then became clear as a result of actually initially observation and subsequently ratification by information from within the Trinational Commission where we have our own people that the forgiveness of the third world debts would quite obviously eliminate the assets which were being purchased by this second group of holding companies, leaving them only with the liabilities that were owed to the Middle Eastern nations. So the group of holding companies, or the bank holding companies, are designed to collapse. When the third world countries say we cannot pay, the bank holding companies say we are bankrupt. At that point, the international bankers say to the Arabs, all right boys, sorry, but the bank holding companies that we gave your money to under those 30 year time deposits of all these billions you've put into our banks over these years, those bank holding companies just went broke. So sorry Arabs, but as of today, you are bankrupt. Possible for the Arab world to go bankrupt? Really? The richest people in the world? Now you'll understand why. Being serviced by the prime banks, hence the Arab nations had no idea that these liabilities were now owned by the holding companies any more than the detonations had stopped paying the prime banks. Now he says that these Arabs, who were nothing but nomads roaming the deserts a few years ago, did not understand any of the inner manipulations of bank financing and world bankers. Therefore, they have fallen for this line all of these years. But now, within the past six to nine months, the international bankers, or I should say the Arabs, have become aware of what the international bankers have done to them. A few months ago, I was in Northern California. An individual in the audience after the meeting said, Pastor Williams, would you have a bite to eat with us after the meeting? I'd like to tell you something. When we sat at the restaurant, she said, my company that I work for handles a transfer of money from Arab countries to America. She said, we have been told that by May 1st, 1987, we must transfer so many millions of dollars out of the Arab countries into America in any kind of securities that are halfway decent to buy. She said, do you know why? I said, yes, because the Arab sheikhs and sheikhs realize that whenever they are declared bankrupt, that the people under them, the millions of people in the Arab countries who have been kept by giveaway programs of housing, food, schooling, medical care, everything, you have never seen such an uprising and turmoil and uh, literal massacres as will happen in the Arab countries when they're declared bankrupt and the people can no longer be given all of these amenities. At that point, the sheikhs and sheikhs know they'll have to run. Where are they going to run? They'll run to America where they have already transferred their assets and the date was given to me by this individual in Northern California that said, by May 1, we have been told we must transfer X number of millions of dollars out of the Arab world into the United States of America. The prime banks and the holding companies arrangement was merely that the prime banks were going to act as servicing agents for the holding companies, again, so that the third world nations didn't know that the holding companies actually were owed the money, because it was filtering through the prime banks and still is. The effect of the elimination of the assets of the second group of holding companies is actually threefold. Now he says that the effect of this, when they announce to the Arabs that the holding companies are broke and that you are, as of today, bankrupt, what are the Arabs going to do in order to attempt to maintain some semblance of order back in their countries? He says the effect of that is threefold and here are the three things that it will cause. They would be insolvent and would be legally able to declare themselves insolvent. First of all, the bank holding companies will be legally broke and can maintain them, can declare themselves insolvent, can say to the international bankers, we've just lost this money, 
the international bankers aren't responsible because they had only given the money to the bank holding companies and the international bankers will say to the Arabs, boys, you're broke as of today. Now, the second effect. Go into chapter seven or 13, I forget, but one or the other. Uh, declare themselves bankrupt, de declare themselves insolvent and legally and legitimately avoid payment to the, to the Middle Eastern nations. And legally and legitimately avoid payment to the Arab nations because the bankers had put it into bank holding companies which they could not be held responsible for. Are you beginning to see the utter degradation, the depth of low-down scoundrelism that's being done by the power controllers of the world to intentionally bring about a bankruptcy of people that they made some years ago? They made them and now they're breaking them by a design plan, the same thing they're doing to the American public. Now let's go to the second point. The precipitous effect of that in view of the westernization of the third world nations is obvious. They would have to and will have to liquidate all the other assets they have, at least a colossal volume of the other assets that they have. Never the Arabs find out they're broke. They have but one choice, liquidate. What do they liquidate? Remember that now they have bought farmland all over America. They likewise have bought stocks and bonds. They control much of the New York Stock Exchange. And automatically, the next morning, after being declared bankrupt, they will dump their stocks onto the New York Stock Exchange. What will happen when the Arabs dump billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars of stock that they've bought on the New York Stock Exchange one Monday morning? What will happen to the stock exchange? What happens to farmland that is already depressed? Remember a few years ago that farmer's land was worth $3,000 an acre? Today that identical same farmland is worth $700 an acre because of deflation that is brought about by the Federal Reserve. Now the Arabs dump all that farmland for sale overnight. What will happen to the price of farmland? It will be forced down even further, maybe $300 an acre. And when that happens, what happens to the farmer? He has no collateral to borrow money next year from the bank in order to plant his crop. What happens to the crops of America and the grocery store shelves and hunger in the cities? Are you beginning to see the scenario for control of a nation? Here is point number three. A colossal volume of the other assets that they have, which frankly are primarily represented by U.S. corporate ownership by them and U.S. corporate ownership of many, many billions of dollars worth of U.S. stock. The effect of the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and the Middle Eastern people's sale of even 25% of their total holdings on the U.S. market and the other markets that U.S. dollar denominated will be absolutely chaotic in terms of the stock market. He says that when this, these stocks are dumped on the stock market overnight, the corporate ownerships are up for sale and the farmland they've bought is now all up for sale. He says the effect on this to the American economy will be absolutely chaotic. Then what will they do? Real estate and everything else. The the catastrophic effect of that has been designed to throw the American stock market, American private corporations, American real estate, and people in general into a state of confusion. The plan is that at that time, the state of confusion will be greeted with the salvation of the benevolent bankers on two fronts. Firstly, they are proposed to eliminate cash because of the collapse, and also, secondarily, to stop drug trafficking. Thirdly, to stop tax cheating. And nobody can argue with, <laughs> with any of those reasons. Now, he says when this happens, and the American people don't know what's going on, and suppose tomorrow morning the stock market should crash. Farmland goes to the very bottom. 
food starts to get shelf get scarce in the grocery store shelves, the bankers come along and say, look what these dirty Arabs have done to you. What would you do? What would the average American do? You'd fall for their line, wouldn't you? You'd say, sure they did. Those dirty Arabs that want to control the whole world, that have bought up so much of America with the money that we gave them through oil prices, and here they have collapsed the American stock market. So the benevolent bankers, that he says with a smirk in his voice, he says the benevolent bankers will step up and say, look what they've done to you. Now, what are we going to do about this? First of all, he says, we've got to have a new currency. Isn't that great? And the next thing we'll have to do is use that new currency to stop the dope traffic in the condition in America. And he said, we'll also have to have a debit card for the purpose of stopping people from tax cheating anymore. Because if we don't, we'll never get ourselves back on our feet again. And if you'll just turn everything over to us benevolent bankers, the Arabs now have broken you, we'll be glad to bring you out of this chaotic condition that we have if you'll just take our debit card and our number. Will the American public fall for it? Lock, stock, and barrel, as the old Georgia farmer would say. Why? Because we've never been told the truth. Now, we continue. It is at that point that they intend to implement a mandatory credit card, identity, social security, government, if you like, ID card, which will be satellite linked through the, quote, Star Wars program, which is nothing to do, at least it is, it's about 40% to do with Star Wars and 62% concerned with the transmission of banking information. But because of the plan that they're initiating, as we've heard tonight, they will go directly from the present currency to a debit card and a number which is required to be taken if you're to do business. And those of you who know the scriptures know that God has already said it would take place. Now you've heard of the Star Wars program, have you? You know that they've said they want to put Star Wars up for the purpose of protecting America against missiles coming in from the Soviets or other countries. He says that from inside information he has gotten from the Council of Foreign Relations and Trilateral Commission and inside sources with internationalists that he has come to find out that the Star Wars program is already put in place and that 60% of the Star Wars program and satellites in the sky have to do with the automatic transfer of funds from all over the world from the debit cards that the internationalists will seek to it that are established with every person having a number and Star Wars is for the purpose of satellite transfer of all of that information into a central computer base where the world will be instantaneously controlled financially and the American taxpayer paid for the Star Wars program to initiate the international bankers, international credit card system and number system that will be initiated and only 40% of the Star Wars program, he says, has anything to do with defense. 60% was put up there for the purpose of the international bankers transfer of computer information and we taxpayers paid for it. To the central bank, which will be the super bank, into which all the other major banks will be linked, into which all the subsidiary banks, rather like a, a family, the super bank is to be the wholesaler, the prime banks, the retailers in this country, the prime banks, the retailers, the, the central banks, the retailers in the, in the foreign countries that have, have capitulated to the IMS program. It is a world design, it is a world order, it is a world program, and our information may be wrong, but in timing, our information is not inaccurate in, in its information, but it may be wrong in its timing. But I he says, our information is correct. He said, I know this to be true. But he said, when they intend to implement this, we do not know. But he says, we think we have an idea and he's about to give what he considers their time frame. He says, we're not sure that this is the right time because we don't have that inside information. 
we do know that the basic premise is correct, but when they plan to initiate it, we're not sure, but he says this is what we think might happen. Subsequent information that I've received from Switzerland is that uh, by October the 1st, 12 countries, 12 detonations had agreed to the IMS proposals. It only needs the rest of them to agree, and it only needs, in fact, Five uh, percent of the total detonations, one twentieth, to equal all of the of the deposits in the banks of the Saudis, because of this twenty to one ratio, it works into, into in contrary reverse. He says that they're so far along with their program that already twelve detonations, as of last month, had signed the agreement to turn over all of their natural resources to the international bankers' banks in turn for complete forgiveness of all of the loans and the interest. And he says they only need so many more nations before they can declare the Arabs bankrupt. The Arab source that verified this information for us in December of 1986 said that the top Leaders in the Arab world know this story, are scared to death, don't know what to do about it, they don't know how to tell the American people, they don't know how to get the information out, but he verified that this material is true, and I personally talked with the man in New York myself who went to the Sheikhs and Sheikhs, and they said to him, what Jonathan May says is so, and now he says... So it doesn't need very many foreign nations to agree to the IMS proposals for the total volume of money owed to equal the total of volume of money on deposit from the Saudis. In fact, only one-fifth of the total debts, I'm sorry, one-twentieth of the total debts will do that, 5%. The, the resultant collapse of the second group of holding companies will precipitate the Saudis and the Kuwaitis liquidation of assets. It will also precipitate their inability to pay the bank holding, the private group of bank holding companies the money that they owe them for the credit extension to them to buy the assets and liabilities, which in turn will precipitate those holding bank holding companies' inability to pay the loans extended to them by the prime banks to buy the foreclosed land which was used as collateral to secure those loans, hence ultimately the prime banks will end up with all the property, which is clearly why they're foreclosing so desperately on as many farms as they are. Um, this is also added to by President Garcia's announcement in February of this year that they were absolutely not going to pay the IMF, uh, going, to, uh, going to pay the, the debts. He says because they are lo allowed to loan out 22 to 1 ratio, it only takes 5% of the third world countries to declare bankruptcy. When they do and accept the plan of the international bankers, only 5%, which only requires a few more nations, then they can declare the bank holding companies bankrupt, the Arabs bankrupt, and initiate their plan because of the contrary reverse of the 22 to 1 loans, only 5% of the third world countries could basically declare the world bankrupt and in the ownership and the hands of the international bankers. When this program is initiated and in place, it will wind up with the international bankers owning all mortgaged property. What will that do to the United States of America and the world? And what control will they have when they initiate their debit card and their automatic number that's required because the country is devastated? You notice that all of this is to their advantage because now they will own the majority of the United States of America, control the Arabs, and by a 30-year program of manipulation will have brought the peoples of the world under their control. Just today, I was told that Congressman George Hansen said to a gentleman who is in the audience tonight only last week that we have less than one year
to inform the American people and turn this situation around, or we can consider ourselves forever slaves. Now, I know it looks like a bleak picture, but it's not. Because you're here tonight. You are America. You are we the people, right? right. Not we the sheeple. That's right. And there are some of you here who are not going to stop until we stay free. And Lindsay Williams is one of them. And that's the reason that I dared tonight to give in what I consider one of the most knowledgeable areas of America to an audience such as you for the first time the story of Jonathan May. Because I believe that here tonight we can start something that can spread across this country and we can stop their little Ponzi game. The Arabs already know about it. There is something we can do about it. John Bergen, the very elite businessman in Minneapolis, Minnesota, was so disturbed when he heard this, and he was so moved until he took one full week out of his busy schedule managing a large firm and went to Washington himself personally. He tried to contact every senator who would listen to him and tried to tell him the story of Jonathan May. He personally stayed there and begged him to listen to his story before some catastrophic event took place in America. He had already verified it with the Arabs. Now, if you will contact your congressman, will you please tell them that America is in jeopardy and that if they ever cared anything about their position, they had better do something now. If you happen to watch the movie or the video America, you watched them shoot, as they said hypothetically, the congressman in Washington. It could happen. Who will go first when they take over? The people who are in power. They are the very people who have the most to lose. You and I have much to lose. We have to do something. We cannot stop 